so this is the point where Hungary says that we are loyal NATO members. The, the joint defense idea of NATO is important. We are doing our part. The Europeans are, should do their part as well, but it's important. And the rest is, is, is a sovereign decision of NATO member states, but it, it cannot be a joint operation or if it's a joint NATO operation that Hungary is requiring an opt out uh, from that. So we don't want now they everybody's talking about a NATO Ukraine mission. According to our understanding, this is a huge mistake because it it is one step fur further to a direct confrontation between NATO and 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 Russia. It 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 is it's it's increasing the risk of uh, nuclear um, conflict as well. Uh, but, um, but many NATO countries want to do this. This is the reality. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I had a wonderful guest on my show. But because I butchered some parts of the introduction, I actually re-recorded this one while freezing him. But never mind. The person I was talking to is nobody less than Balazs Orban, the political director of Hungary's prime minister, Viktor Orban. And no, the two are not related. They just share the same last name. Mr. Orban here has been working at the prime minister's office since 2018, becoming his political director in 2021. And he won also a seat in Hungary's parliament in 2022. In addition, Mr. Orban is also a scholar, chairing and directing several educational institutions and he just published his second book called Hussar Cut, the Hungarian strategy for connectivity, in which he lays out what I would call a realism-based strategy for a prosperous Hungarian foreign policy that is not tethered to one or the other power bloc, but to many nations at once, linking them all as a keystone state. This is super interesting, especially as it's coming from a thinker of a EU and NATO member country. So today we will discuss Hungary's grand strategy and Mr. Orban's views on how his country should navigate the post-unipolar world order. Mr. Orban, welcome. Hello, good morning, Dr. Lotte. Thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. It's uh, super busy for you at the moment with, with elections and so going on. But I really want to talk to you about your book. Could you mm. explain to me what exactly is a Hussar cut? What needs what does the Hussar need to cut? <laughs> well, Hussars are one fig important figures of political um, innovation uh, and military innovation. Uh, this is uh, hussars are are light cavaliers, Hungarian light cavaliers. It was invented by Hungarians and then used by many armies abroad. And the master stroke of the hussars is a hussar cut, which is a brave, decisive, um, uh, unexpected uh, move, which turns the the situation and the and the balance of structure upside down and brings victory and glory to hussars so i i did choose this um this analogy to uh, to show that what we hungarians are doing is actually can seen as a reflection of our history and and heritage and can seen as a hussar cut a brave decisive move which goes a bit against the mainstream uh, it's brave uh, it's some people are saying that it's risky move but if we are able to to keep it keep it in that way it means that uh, that we will it will bring victory for our country because our goal is to have in the 21st century um, a prosperous peaceful and successful hungary which is an which is a keystone country uh, in the region and we want to find a way uh, to go there so so our our idea is that most probably we can turn Turn to our ancestors, and and use the idea of of Magyars and Hussars who are doing some brave political and bold political maneuvers and trying to navigate through uh, 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 an era of conflict. This is why this is this is why this is the title. And we are going through an era of conflict, and 
you know, Hungary has been going a different route than what most other countries in the EU have been doing. I mean, Viktor Orban, uh, your, your, your political leader, stood up to against, uh, for instance, weapon deliveries to Ukraine for a very long time and is, is constantly talking differently about Ukraine. He constantly says, we need to de-escalate, we need to get out of this, we need to, to, to finish this war as soon as possible, which is very different from what we hear from other leaders. Is that what you what you also envision as this, this going against the grain and the Hussar cut? Yes, and but I think uh, that the that the Russian Ukrainian war it's it's part of a bigger piece. Uh, we don't believe in conspiracy theories, but but we do believe in geopolitical analysis, and we have to see that the world changed in the last years, and the Western powers changed uh, changed their strategies um, until. Now, based on neoliberal ideology, many Western countries, mainly the United States, were advocating in favor of peace, stability, uh, connectivity, uh, mutually beneficial economic cooperation, globalization, even globalism as an ideology, which was a driving force behind it. But then they realized that with this strategy, some other powers, superpowers, big powers, mid powers uh, became, um, became uh, stronger. And uh, they changed the 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 geopolitical equilibrium. So if they want to keep the hegemony, they have to figure out something new. And now we are in a phase of a new Western strategy, which is about the opposite of connectivity, which is about decoupling, de-risking, French shoring, block formation logics, um, and and so on and so on. These are the most trendy words what we keep keep using in our um, uh, language and the idea is that we have to separate ourselves as Westerners from the rest of the world and prepare for an ultimate conflict between us and them. Now between democracies and autocracies, how it is formulated by um, a, a world-known scholar Francis Fukuyama, uh, for example, we Hungarians we are integrated into the West. Um, uh, we are members of NATO, members of the European Union, but uh, but we see it as a dead end street. Uh, we don't want to follow that strategy because we don't want to remain periphery. According to our understanding, if the West West wants to wants to um, keep up its uh, its leading position, then it has to get engaged. It has it not. It has to be. Um, a, a, a peaceful and very strong and very active role in 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 global uh, issues and Hungary, uh, which is in the central of Eastern Western cooperation, it 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 lies on the middle of the traditional trade routes between East and West. Hungarian tribes came from East 1,100 years ago, but then they became Christian and integrated into the Western society. So Hungary in that situation can, can be a pivotal state or a, uh, or a, or a keystone state. And, and this is why I think from a, from a Russian-Ukrainian point of view, what is, what is intellectually the most interesting question, why the West reacted differently to this part of the conflict, what uh, what started in 22, then what's happened in the Crimea in 2014. The Western reaction was different because back at that time, we, the Westerners, wanted to isolate the conflict, freeze the conflict. And now what we are doing is the opposite, that we escalating the conflict. We turn it, we, we transform it to a, to a global conflict where, where everybody has to pick uh, science and this is extremely risky, and this is part of this new Western uh, block formation strategy, which is, according to our understanding, it's not good for us. The Hungarian position about the war from the very first day is is the same. We don't see that there is a solution of this conflict on the battlefields. So the sooner we stop uh, fighting, the sooner the two two players are stop fighting with each other, the more um, uh, lives we can save. And now it's a, there is a getting, uh, there is a bigger risk of, uh, of, um, of, of changing this conflict into a NATO-Russia direct confrontation, which is uh, the entrance of the Third World War. And this is something which is 
is according to our understanding definitely not the interest of west uh, but obviously not the interest of hungary but we are marching into this direction so hungary has to it, it's it's obviously not uh, the strongest voice in that debate but we are a neighboring country we condemn the russian aggression we having a big humanitarian humanitarian operation to help the ukrainians but but we hosting refugees but but we are not sending weapons and we are not we don't want to push into uh, the war and we use our all our diplomatic resources to to be the promoters inside the west of uh, of uh, peaceful solutions i am very glad to hear that these are the kinds of words that from other european leaders and, and european states we just don't get um and this is not exactly what i had planned to talk about but i really need to know this like um if inside NATO, a Hungary as a NATO member would have the power to block a lot of decisions, because at least what we hear, we outsiders, we always hear, oh, in NATO, everybody's equal, every and and every member has a has a has a veto. Um, is that actually possible? Could does Hungary have the same standing in NATO as other members like Germany and France and the United States? Could Hungary stand up to an escalation of this war from the NATO side? So honestly, Mr. Mr. Lottas, the, the situation is very complicated, even from our point of view as well, because uh, because according to our understanding, NATO is an is a very important tool. We started our military modernization program way before the Ukrainian uh, conflict. We stand we spend more than two percent of our GDP because we know that we should be first and foremost responsible for our defense. But if we have NATO and we have NATO members, that's an extra security. And for this reason, NATO is an important tool uh, for us. From a European point of view, NATO should, um, European NATO members should understand that, that if we Europeans are not able to defend ourselves and we rely only to our American friends, then it means that we have to pay the price in a sense that the Americans will want to tell us for obvious reason, I cannot criticize them for doing that, what should be done in a field of foreign policy, trade um, and, and and diplomatic relations. So this is, this is something which is not good for Europe. It's good that we are in an alliance structure together with the Americans. It's a defense uh, community, but Europeans should be able to defend uh, themselves. This is why, according to our understanding, President Trump gets it right uh, when he asks for more engagement on, on the European side. Um, and, and about the, the future of NATO, according to our understanding, NATO is based on the treaty. So it's a defense alliance mechanism. Openly, it says that it's not in direct confrontation with anybody. Now. And this is the, exactly the Hungarian um, standpoint. Uh, the problem is that some member states are keep talking um, in a different way or different mood, and they want to bring in the the NATO as as uh, as 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 a as an organization which is which is part of the conflict, which is part of the current Ukrainian Russian conflict, and which can be seen as a for example an Indo Pacific. Um, attack organization or or uh, an uh, or an organization which makes uh, joint operations uh, in the territory of third countries, which shouldn't be the case. Um, so so this is the point where Hungary says that we are loyal NATO members. The the joint defense idea of NATO is important. We are doing our part. The Europeans are, should do their part as well, but it's important. And the rest is, is, is a sovereign decision of NATO member states, but it, it cannot be a joint operation or if it's a joint NATO operation that Hungary is requiring an opt out uh, from that. So we don't want now they, everybody's talking about a NATO Ukraine mission. According to our understanding, this is a huge mistake because it it is one step fur further to a direct confrontation between NATO and 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 Russia it 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 is it's 
it's increasing the risk of uh, nuclear um, conflict as well. Uh, but um, but many NATO countries want to do this. This is the reality. So what we can say, as we are Hungarian politicians, is responsible for for Hungarian people that we don't have direct confrontation with Russia and we want to keep it that way. And we want to have opt out from this NATO mission. Until now, this is this is the point where we can get. We try to convince everybody, some leaders, some elections, cause some changes. Um, there is a new government in Slovakia. There are uh, rising um, alternative forces in, in the Netherlands, in France, in Austria. So I hope that the, I hope that there will be a new um, uh, president in the United States. So so I I I hope that at the end of the end of this year, the world or the Western strategy will look differently than it looks today. But um, but the situation is extremely risky now. Can you explain to yourself why it is that Hungary is alone with this position? Why is Hungary the only one that seems to want to de-escalate? And as you said, other leaders and other, other NATO member countries at the moment, they seem to want to have further escalation with Russia. Can you can you explain it to yourself? I, I don't understand it. Uh, I think at the beginning it was it was it was about good intention. So so because you know what happened from a moral point of view, it's obvious that the Russians attacked, used force, uh, illegally uh, used force, and attacked a sovereign country. So everybody morally, everybody. Uh, on the western side was on the ukrainian what with together with the ukrainians and and but if you are morally involved in that conflict then then sooner or later you will end up thinking that this is your conflict and and the hungarian position from day one was that we have our moral re responsibilities but this is a slavic conflict this is an old conflict between two slavic nations this is not a European uh, conflict, um, and 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 when they started to talk about that, first we sent some some um, some some helmets, and then we support some some other you know equipment. But then, if you are getting involved as you are starting to fight your own war, then there is no no red line for you. And then people started to talk about um, uh, guns. Then people started to talk about uh, vehicles and tanks, uh, fire jets and, and and missiles and and so on and so on. And now many Western leaders are talking about sending troops. So this is the circle of escalation. And and first it was a rational calculation based on based on moral values. But now I think that for many Western leaders it's a personal issue. Because, you know, personally, their political career is affiliated with that. And they don't want to lose the war. They don't want to get humiliated um, by, by the Russians. And I understand it from a, from a personal point of view, but from a political and strategic point of view, this is the biggest mistake uh, what, what, you can, what you can get. Our problem is that, that there is a big risk that at the end of by the end of this war ukraine will lose more than they would lose without starting the war and the responsibility for that decision from the ukrainian leadership side and from from the western leadership side it's huge we don't want to criticize the ukrainians because they have the right to fight for their sovereignty but we can criticize the Western leaders that they don't see that this will be the most realistic outcome of, 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 of the conflict. In, but unfortunately, you know, it became a personal issue for many leaders. So rationality not anymore plays a, as an important role as it played before. That is horrible because, you know, anyone with eyes has seen how this spiral escalated, right? And you talked about the difference in the reaction 2014 and 2022. 20, uh, and one of the differences is that we now have Angela Merkel on record and, and, and Hollande, who all said Minsk was supposed to buy time for Ukraine to arm it. <laughs> and we have the, that on record. 
And we see how then the escalation goes further and further, how we even at uh, three weeks after the invasion had a moment when maybe Ukraine could have come out of this as a neutral country. And there was, we now know this absolutely as a matter of fact, that there was a, a very clear, uh, uh, basically almost agreed on uh, paper on the table. And then we walked away from that. And by now, Europe is on the way for the fifth time in 400 years to walk straight into a general war, the fifth time. Um, and it seems that we are not able to stop it. Um, do yeah. you have... Do you have What we are doing in a, on a council meeting, European council meeting, we, start, we started um, try to initiate even strategic discussions on that issue. That, look, guys, it's a council meeting. There is no press. We can, we, you can make your declarations, but what is the goal? How, what is, what is the strategic goal? How we want to, what we want to achieve and how we want to achieve uh, and how we controlling the risks. And honestly, we couldn't initiate any serious discussion on a council level with European uh, leaders about that because everybody was saying that no 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 we just we just on a good track we just have to keep pushing ukraine is going to win things are going to be in a in a uh, in a in a good way and so on and so on yes and if you are questioning any of these assumptions then you are obviously a traitor a putin puppet or somebody who is who is um, who is serving a, a, a different master? So and they want to really make it impossible to open conversations about the strategic goals of the Western powers in this current Ukrainian uh, Russian conflict. So honestly, what we Hungarians see now is for this reason, um, this conflict cannot be. So cannot be closed by by European leaders. They are just not strong enough and not um, dedicated enough. So I I think all this or the the only short term hope what we can get can come only from you only from America. That the new Republican president is saying that that uh, that um, this is this is an again uh, a never ending war. Which is not good for our country. We should focus on, on, um, uh, on other priorities and 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 let's uh, let's stop the confrontation. And then the Europeans and the Ukrainians and the Russians ha they have to change their way of thinking and adapt immediately to this American approach. Honestly, what I see today as a short term solution to close the conflict and to save lives and and to save Euro Asian stability is this. And this is very sad, but but realistic. You and I, we have we have a problem because we both, I think, we both subscribe to realism as a basic as a basic view of international relations and how how countries move. But what we are perceiving right now or seeing right now is that states do not make any more decisions that are based upon a, re a realism based assessment even on 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 issues of war and peace because to me this is utterly irrational what europe is doing at the moment because it's hurting its own interests uh, hugely economically militarily it's risking it's 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 in incredible risk and we this this doesn't fit into the box at some point ideology is overriding now rash rational thought how how this is an unfair question and i haven't warned you about it but how do you think as realists we can make we can we can reconcile this and and then make policy decisions if if one part of the of the globe is going irrational um i i agree with your description what is going on i just would like to make some some uh, some additional points to that so i think part of part of europe uh, some parts of Europe act rationally. Mm -hmm. So, like, for example, Central Europe. Um, Central Europe was, in the 90s, uh, seen as, you know, the most trendy place on Earth. I'm not just talking about Hungary, but talking about the entire region. Uh, you know, the Russians are out. Um, market 
capitalism arrive, democracy arrive. So if you want to make business, if you want to make connections, if you want to um, uh, be involved in into something good and big, you ha- you should come to uh, to Central Europe and do something here. And um, and we we integrated ourselves to the West. Um, the living standards went high, and so on and so. On. But the attention. Um, what we had in Central Europe, it went away because other parts of the world became more and more interesting because it, those 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 regions are are more interesting from a geopolitical point of view, bigger population, um, biggest involvement in 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 new industries, um, natural resources, and so on and so on. So the attention went away from from Central Europe. And some Central European countries, they see that their only chance is to sign up for the block formation logic, sign up for the mm-hmm. new Cold War logic, just these days on the other side of the war, and be the be the be the edge uh, of 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 the West, be the last frontier of the West, because you don't want to lose the last frontier. You need to provide some military support. You need to provide some some FDI uh, to keep alive uh, the last frontier. And you need that to to get prepared for the ultimate confrontation. And many Central European countries, they are signing up for that strategy for for historical reasons, because they are afraid of the Russians, they are afraid of the Germans. They see that this is their only way to maintain their sovereignty. They can get really some investments, some military equipment, some new technology. So it's good for them. But the problem for 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 us Hungarians is that that we don't want to sign up for that. We are geographically in a different region, the Carpathian Basin, surrounded by mountains as a center of 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 of, of really a, a, a trade routes between Istanbul and 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 Berlin and Paris and London. This is and Vienna. So so this is this is a different different era so the, we need a different selling point a different story which makes this region uh, interesting so i i just wanted to add that some central european actors they act rationally what i don't see is what the germans are doing so so germany is not acting rationally because everything what is happening as as a as a consequence of it it's undermining german uh, political power, military power, economic power, competitiveness, and so on and so on. So the biggest problem is the German German lack of leadership. We really had huge confrontations with Germany in the last decades. Uh, Germany is an important strategic partner for Hungary, probably the most important one. Culturally, the two countries are very close to each other. So even when we had huge civilizational conflict with the Germans, the last issue was the migration. When Angela Merkel said, we are common school tour and we closed our borders. This was a huge confrontation between the German and the Hungarian political elites and the grassroots voters. But even that, even in that period of time, we, we were quite sure that there was a German strategic thinking based on their own interests. Probably they were miscalculating things as they did it with the migration issue or did it with the green transition. But at least that was a rational calculation at the beginning based on German interest. But now what we see is there is no rational calculation like this uh, on that side. Probably it's because of the weak leadership. Probably it's because of the three-party coalition. There are many possible answers. Um, And um, my job is not to to get involved in German domestic uh, politics, but we see what we see as this, and this lack of German um, um, vision and leadership and interest, German interest-based policy. Um, it's, it, 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 it puts almost the entire Central European and Continental European um, region into a, a big problem. And in your book, you write very clearly that Hungary has no interest in block formation. This doesn't make any sense. Hungary wants to connect the different regions and and benefit from trade with with everybody and be friends with everyone. Like, honestly, when I read your book, I I almost 
I almost was reminded of like a neutral country that, you know, wants to be friends with everybody. Hungary is not like that, but the, the strategy should be the same, right? For a small country in order to, yeah. in order to benefit. It's, it's the opposite, not remaining neutral, which means isolation from everybody, but getting connected with everybody. So mm. it's the same logic, but a different outcome. So we do believe in multi-vectoral foreign policy. Like, mm. like, you know, European Union is based on the treaties. We agreed that we share our sovereignty in, in 30 policy eras and we work together. But we have a legal document which is managing the, 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 the details and the possible conflicts of, of the cooperation. And we have signed for that. It's, it's good for Hungary, um, but, but not more. We are members of NATO, which is, as we described, is a defense alliance. We are members or observer members of the Turkish uh, Council, because the Turkish states, um, uh, based on our history, they treat us like the most Western Turkish uh, country, uh, which is which is a paradox since we are Christian. But on the other hand, it's rational because this is our uh, history. And we are very proud of this cooperation and we want to cooperate with them. And the Chinese president is, is visiting Hungary now. We are, for like 10 years, part of um, the BRI cooperation because it's an infrastructural uh, cooperation based on also on the idea of, of, of prosperity and, and mutual connections. We invite everybody. We have South Korean companies, Japanese companies, Chinese companies, um, German companies, Austrian companies, Dutch companies, and American companies. And we, we are all very proud of them. And we just want to convince them to, to invest more technologically into Hungary, make business there. And we try to encourage the Hungarian companies to get connected to this international structure and benefiting uh, as an economy and as local players. Uh, from it, so this is our uh, strategy. It's it's neutrality, but not based on distance keeping from everybody, but based on cooperating with everybody at a certain certain level, which gives you more maneuvering space. And at the end of the day, it provides you more more sovereignty than without this. So if the if the war in Ukraine can be de-escalated after all, would you also then try to re re-establish the connections with the Russians and with, with African nations, I suppose, right? As much as much interconnectedness as possible. Of course. And uh, even even now we try to uh, keep uh, saved the connections, at least what we can save. We still have we still have, for example, energy cooperation uh with the Russians because because we don't understand the point. So if if it's about energy independence of Europe, which is which is crucial because we don't have energy resources, we have to import all our energy resources. So it's a very vulnerable um, uh, situation. So why we want to get rid of with one part of the cooperation, which brings up the the the, the prices. Uh, destroys our competitiveness and and it increases the level of our dependency. So we want independence, which means that we need to keep open all, all our channels. Um, and the energy is a very good example. So we want to keep up the cooperation with the Russians and we want to have competition between the Americans, the Russians, the uh, Qataris or the Arab uh, countries. And the rest of the world, and 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 achieve the cheapest prices in a most secure way, because this is what benefits the Hungarian people. They are not signing up for any global ideology. They they elect leaders to 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 be to, to be able to protect uh, themselves and serve the interests on the global stage. This is what international politics based on a national conservative point of view, looks like, according to my understanding. This is also what makes sense. People elect leaders to look after them and not, not, not after some global uh, ideology, according to which everything has to fall into line. Um, I am I am happy to hear that. I'm happy that 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 you have this outlook. And um, the one thing the one thing I still wonder is if there is 
actually more chance to negotiate a peace to this horrible war that needs to end through a country like Hungary or Turkey, maybe even Serbia, than Switzerland. Because Switzerland is going to do this, this, this peace initiative, which I think is nothing but a PR stunt for for Western leaders and a multi-connected approach like Hungary. I think at the moment, Hungary probably has more um, political standing with Russia than Switzerland, but could you could you give me your, your two cents on this? Uh, yes, we hope that the time will come. So the Hungarian position is clear. We support every peace initiatives because the more we talk about peace is the better for, for, for everybody. But according to history and, and you know, like, practical way of life this is this is not going to happen in a way that somebody is declaring um, a, you know a detailed peace plan what will happen with that and that and that and then all players will say okay it's fine we accept it let's go and sign it because uh, now there is no winning side of the conflict if somebody wins then the winner can dictate the terms but this in this conflict now there is no winning side so so but the hungarian initiative is always that we should rather focusing on on ceasefire because because first and foremost the most important is that now uh, soldiers are killing each other so it's like we we should stop stop killing each other because if we keep killing each other it's impossible to think that there will be some diplomats in ties and 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 sit down and in the civilized way uh talking about uh, the future of of the continent because people and and people affiliated with those countries on both sides are now risking their life to achieve some some uh, strategic goals so they will not let it happen so our message is always that in general we support all peace plans but but first and foremost we should encourage let's use this word encourage um the 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 the, the parties who are involved in that conflict to sit down bring in the europeans and the americans as well and to negotiate a, a ceasefire and use this as a window of opportunity to to start very hard very complicated very painful emotionally uh extremely touching um negotiations where we cannot just solve this problem but we are able to provide a new security umbrella for for the entire euro asian uh continent which, because this is what is in stake so this is what was destroyed by this war. Now no one knows which are the security guarantees, not just for Ukraine, but for Europe and for Russia and for America. And so, so it's like, this is going to be a very long process, but first have the first tiny little step and which is about ceasefire. Because if we don't have ceasefire, then from a PR point of view, uh, these initiatives can can seen as as useful ones, but they cannot be taken seriously, unfortunately. Um, may I ask you one last question? Um, because you write in your book about the importance of accept accepting conflicting truths, that in order to build a foreign policy, you need to somehow reconcile two truths that might not go together at the same time. And this struck me as very insightful because it seems to me that the current Europe, uh, uh, Western European approach uh, is to ram through one single truth and nothing else. I mean, you cannot accept Russia's version of what happened. This is what needs to be decried as propaganda, it needs to be, needs to be uh, destroyed. Now, do you see hope in in this approach of of living with conflicting truths? Or how do you how do you conceptualize this? Mm. Well, I th <laughs> honestly, I think that conceptualizing this it's easier than doing it in practice, because uh, because what I described in the book is not nothing. There is nothing new under the sun. So even the ancient Greek philosophers. Uh, we're, we're, we're writing about this. 
So it's a general knowledge that this is how you how you make uh, decisions. Um, this is how you live your life. This is how you're going to be successful. The problem is how you do it uh, on a practical daily basis if you are leading a country. And, and this is what I try to describe in a book. So for example, if you, we talk about connectivity and talk about being open, but in the meantime, we think that it's important part of our connectivity strategy to be stick to our own values, which are national values and obviously different one than others, other values. So stick to the idea of sovereignty, stick to the idea of traditional families, stick to the idea of importance of Christianity. And, and you know, in the same time, when you show openness toward the rest of the world, which has and which has different values, but in the meantime, you stick to your own values, it first it seems to be a, a paradox. But but if you do it in practice, you realize that. This is how the world works. So, so your partners and the other countries, they don't want you to give up yourself. If you are respectful and you are open and you are honest, then they accept that you are different. Um, and, and, and then you on this on this basis, you can have good relations and 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 practical uh, beneficial deal with others. Um, I think the best example is again probably the migration issue. Um, the the uh, Hungary is very well known as one of the most anti illegal migration country on earth. We build a fence. We are openly on a daily basis talking about that we should save our Christian civilization. Uh, Europe shouldn't be converted into an uh, Islamic civilization. And in the same time, we 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 have the best and 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 strongest and deepest strategic partnerships with Turkey. And and why it is because the Turks understand that it's not against them. We respect Muslim civilization. We respect Turkey. We respect what they are doing. We see that it's a it has a lot of benefits. We just want to keep ourselves as we are. And on this basis, we are very much ready and open in a respectful way to strengthen our cooperation on field of energy, military cooperation, economic cooperation with Turkey. And, and, and the Turks understand this. And the same with the other parts of the world. So this is just one example. But, but you get all the criticism from the Westerners. You get all the criticism from the radicals. You get all the criticism with the fund from the fundamentalists. But you have to... You have to be uh, transparent, honest, you know, outspoken on that, and keep keep this track on everyday policy making, every decisions when you are doing. If you are doing it in the long term, we are in power for fourteen years, so most probably this is also part of it that uh, we have the longest serving foreign minister. So many many countries they have personal good personal connections with. With him, so these these elements, then being transparent, straightforward, stick to your uh, stick to your own um, values, but also open uh, to the interest of others, uh, and based on personal relations. This is what can, what can save the world, or I hope at least it can save Hungary for the twenty first century. Pragmatism, indeed. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Orban. This was very enlightening to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Lottas.